when you sort of come to Cafe Sydney, what you want is you want to have a whole lot of different backstories to your food, like anybody does. But the beauty of running something like that is that is that you can take up the production of, of one particular item from someone, or you can take be one of the few people who get a particular product because you can you can constantly support using all of it. And so you can create a very unique menu within the context of a high volume uh, restaurant. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There's a romantic notion about restaurants and it's pinned to the vast majority that are local, family-run small venues where the owners pour their heart and soul into the business. But some restaurants are huge operations that rely on a big engine room of chefs and front of house to help create the heart and soul of major cities too. What sort of chef does it take to not only manage a huge team, but ensure customer satisfaction and repeat business too? James Kidman is the executive chef of Cafe Sydney in Sydney. James, how are you going? Yeah, good, mate. How are you? Good. You've uh, worked in some pretty big venues over your entire career. Was, was that always a goal of yours to have such big kitchens and teams? Um, no, not at all. I mean, I think like most people, you, you start off with that dream that you're going to own a, a little, you know, local neighborhood restaurant and, um, but it just didn't transpire that way, uh, for whatever reason. And, um, and I sort of enjoyed doing the larger venues and I think I sort of probably was better at them than probably the smaller venues where you've got, you know, a ton more support really uh, happening, whether in the kitchen or the background. So, yeah, I think that's why. We can uh, look at all of the incredible venues that you've been part of that have helped shape the culinary landscape of um, Sydney and Canberra. But where did it all start for you? Where did you get an interest in food? Um, <clears throat> oh, easy. Uh, first of all, big family, uh, four kids, three boys, uh, playing lots of sport, always hungry. Um, <laughs> but I think... Uh, um, but I think one of the things was that um, back in the day in the sort of late 70s and early 80s, mum did a lot of cooking for the family. But she also, uh, my dad was a, a banker and we had a lot of um, entertaining going on at home because, you know, the restaurant scene wasn't what it is today. And uh, she would have this budget of money for these um, these elaborate sort of dinners that they would do. And she was cooking from you know, the, the Cordon Bleu books or, or magazines, which she'd sort of bought, you know, a a thing of every week and they were in a big folder or, you know, she had um, mastering the art of French cookery and all those sorts of things. And so we, you know, we sort of, you know, uh, got the scraps, I suppose, of those, (laughs) (laughs) what was left. But, um, and I remember all these sort of, yeah, just really beautiful French sort of cooking at home for these these dinners, and and, and Mum made a really big effort um, at home. We had these lovely Sunday lunches every every week, and um, so that sort of I think sort of shaped my sort of love of food really. And um, and in all honesty, I mean, I almost left school when I was about fifteen or, or sixteen in Brisbane um, to take up a chef's apprenticeship, um, and I sort of got convinced otherwise and uh, to stay at school and, um, you know, get my HSC. I eventually came back down to Sydney, finished the last two years of school in Sydney and um, a couple of failed attempts at, at university, um, you know, and I, and I failed beautifully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I sort of, um, I found myself one day, uh, I was working for Christine Manfield in her first restaurant at the Phoenix uh, uh, Cafe, I thought Phoenix restaurant in or bistro whatever it was called at the top of um uh, the pub in Wallara and you know I sort of saw what she was doing and and I kind of it sort of ignited something in me and um and I was I was scheduled to go away on this overseas trip uh, over to to Europe which I, I ultimately did and then I came back and shortly after that I I sort of delved into the world of of commercial cookery and and becoming a chef probably about the age of I was either 23 or 24, something along those lines. And um, that, and that's been it. So, um, but uh, uh, yeah, so it's been a sort of varied 
sort of uh, journey to sort of get there from school and to university, a few travels, and then um, you know, doing dishes for a living. So it's been it's been interesting. That's a, a little bit older than many that uh, enter the industry. What was it like being a 23, 24-year-old uh, entering the industry when a lot enter at a younger age? Um, look, I was pretty warmly received because the first place that I worked was uh, or at was a place called Trezini's over in Mossman, which was, you know, this big cafe sort of that had come up from Melbourne. And um, and they were killing it in Mossman, and uh, um, and I sort of heard about it, and and there was a job for an, an you know an apprentice, um, and I sort of rocked up, just sort of coming back from overseas, and and I was working for a market research company that I'd worked for for a bit, and um, I sort of really wanted to get stuck into cooking, and and I walked in and had an interview with who was my first head chef, Richard Moiser, and we said. Yeah, and we sort of sat down and we had this, you know, really good chat. He asked me where I'd been and I sort of told him where I'd been and, and you know, and I'd, we'd been to Amsterdam and done the whole Amsterdam thing and he looked at me and smiled. And, um, and you know, from that time on, I was sort of, he, he gave me an, an opportunity um, and I just grabbed it. I loved it. It was, uh, you know, after about one day, I knew that that was where I was supposed to be and, and he was just an amazing mentor and, and and was a very good friend up until he died uh, a year or so ago now. So, um, yeah, so that he was my first head chef. And that was my first job and it was and it was awesome. It was just great. What did you take from, from that time in that kitchen? Oh, I think probably just a love of food is probably the big thing. You know, Richard would um, suggest places that I should go eat. He would um, he'd bring me in all sorts of cookbooks to look at. Um, you know, it was it was just a place where, you know, I was working with someone who just loved the industry, who loved to cook, and and um, and he really mentored me, and he continued to be a sounding board for any job that I'd do in the future, whether that had been while I was while I was an apprentice or when I sort of went on to much more senior roles. Um, yeah, he was he was always the first person that I'd give a call to and have a chat about it. You made a real name for yourself as executive chef at Otto over almost a decade, winning many accolades. What was the real inspirations before that time for you? Uh, oh, look, I had look, I had a couple of re- I had three really amazing jobs um, after I suppose the latter stage of my apprenticeship. I spent a couple of years working for Anthony Massara in Sydney. At what is or was the pavilion on the park, and he was just a guy who got flavour. You know, he could just extract so much flavour out of food. His his cooking had a beautiful sort of refined nature to it, but somehow he got what people wanted to eat. He could translate that onto a plate, and you know, he delivered it. And you know, still to this day, his ice creams are still some of the best that I've ever. <laughs> Had maybe that's just because I love ice cream, but he, you know, he was, he was just, he was just great. You know, he he really understood flavour more than a lot of chefs that I've ever met. Um, and then I sort of after that, I worked for a guy over in Perth. I spent two and a half years over in Perth and uh, followed a girl over there. Um, had a sort of interesting time in Perth, but I worked worked for about twelve months or more with a guy called Neil Jackson, who's now retired and. He sort of did some quirky sort of food, I suppose, in a way. He he sort of he was a bit of a lover of Charlie Trotter at the time, and and that sort of you know kind of a bit sort of quirky uh, combinations. But technically, he was just brilliant. He had you know done his apprenticeship at the Savoy Hotel. His butchery skills were amazing. Um, but he was just a really giving guy. Like I was this older uh, uh, commie or. Demi or whatever you wanted to call me in this small restaurant in, in Perth. And I was running the pastry section and uh, and I'd waited for an opportunity to work for him because, you know, opportunities in Perth, didn't, good opportunities in Perth at the time, sort of 1998, didn't come up very often, let me tell you. And so I'd gone in there and he taught me how to debone pig's trotters. I just went in there. I knew somebody who knew him, knew him and, and, and I said, oh, look, can I come in and learn how to do that? And so I was sort of next cab off the rank in getting a job and uh, um, 
and he was just a really cool guy. Like he was over, he was about my age now, a little bit older. And, you know, we used to listen to, you know, I think it was Moby was coming out at the time and, uh, um, and Groover Marta. And we were listening to guys like that and, you know, listening to sort of other music in the kitchen during the day. And, um, and he'd sort of buy in different chocolates for me to use and, and to work with. And, and he, he, he just, he just was really giving. He was just a lovely, lovely man to work for. And, uh, and we're still mates. Um, but he's sort of, sort of, you know, pretty much retired, I think, these days. And, and he still does a bit of work consulting stuff for, for people. But he was amazing. And then I, I sort of came back from, from uh, WA after the Olympics and I, I ended up working at 41 restaurant for Dima Sawyer and um and that was just phenomenal that was just an amazing job um I spent you know almost two years there and I think that was in hours terms probably the equivalent of about three and a half hours three and a half years <laughs> that kind of thing but um you know worth every cent um you know that uh, that I got out of it it was and I, and I worked with Jocks on Frillo there he was my chef de cuisine um, so yeah, it was a pretty interesting time, but, um, you know, you're doing sort of, honestly, you're doing 70 hours a week, every single week. Um, but you know, I walked away from there being able to fillet fish, you know, properly and debone rabbits and hares and all sorts of things. There just wasn't, you just, there was, you weren't scared of any sort of style of service or, you know, technically it was a really brilliant place to work and, and, um, you know, but but it was brutal as well. It was it was really quite brutal. But I'm not sure whether I'd recommend it these days. But uh, um, but I'd certainly, you know, I got a, I got a huge amount out of it. I loved it. Um, um, so yeah, I suppose they were the sort of they were the three major things, past Trazzini's that really influenced um, influenced me um, greatly before going on to Otto. So. Well, Otto has been a, a real feature of the Sydney dining landscape for a couple of decades now, and you're at the helm for almost a decade. Take take us back into the to the kitchen there. Do you, do you have any um, memories or real special moments that you could tell us about about the period of time there? Oh, just so many. Um, what a restaurant. Um, and still to this day, I mean, Richard just does an amazing job there. He just continued it on. He's such a good cook. It's unbelievable. But um, look, I think I think what Otto was then, and, I'm, I, and having eaten there a few times now, still is the epitome of what service and hospitality is about. You know, you, it's that kind of place where you just want to make sure that you know, anybody has a really memorable experience. I mean, I, I cooked for all sorts of people from movie stars and rock stars and, you know, political dignitaries. But I think the thing that typified it for me, and it's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, is, you know, I walked out of there one day at sort of about six o'clock, I think it was. And I was uh, walking down the wharf and there was this kid in the, in the restaurant. And I've told the story a few times, but he... He was sitting down, it was about six or just after, he's sitting down with this girl. He might have been about 20, if that, 19, 20. He was reading this uh, wine list. I was just watching him. He's reading this wine list like it was just, I don't know, some you know scientific manual that he'd never come across before. <laughs> and, and yet he's, he's, he's dining with this gorgeous, you know, looking girl. And, and, and so I just, you know, got my, you know, my cube of a, of a mobile phone as they were back then. And I gave, I gave the restaurant a call and I said to Leanne, who, who always answered the phone, I said, look, you see those two, those two kids there. Let's give them two glasses of champagne. Let's put down a, a Reggiano plate with some olives and handmade Grassini on it. And let's just, let's just start that night off for these guys really, really well. And I just watched it and he got two glasses of champagne in front of him. And he got this sort of starting plate he didn't know where they were coming from and you could just see his shoulders relax. You could see this girl going, my God, who am I eating with? <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and that kind of set the tone for, for their night. And, and that wasn't an unusual experience for a lot of people at that restaurant. And I, I still think it holds on to it today. It's, um, it's the backbone of what it is. It is the quintessential 
hospitality restaurant and, and some of the people that I worked there, whether that been in the kitchen or, and or floor, were just some of the best, you know, at, at that style of, uh, of food, to be quite honest, so, or style of service and food and, and business. You know, it was an amazing, amazing place, great time, really good time there. It was the first time you were at the helm of a restaurant that was feeding up to 450 guests a day and it, and it sort of steered the rest of your career to do really huge venues. What, what did you learn from that time of having such a big brigade and feeding that many people? Oh, well, first of all, uh, big brigade, um, look after them, work out your rosters really well, uh, rotate them, give people weekends off, make sure they get nights off, make sure they get you know, tips, make sure, um, you know, you're continually moving them around the kitchen and keeping their development happening so that you can maintain that brigade because it doesn't matter where you work, but in bigger brigades in particular, you need to have a hardcore group of people that stay with you for long periods of time to make sure the mechanism works consistently. And so you have to you know, make sure that you're managing it all the time. Um, and also just make sure that when you're looking for staff, you're looking for every, you know, you're looking under every single rock, you know, whether it's seek or whether it's, you know, a random email, whether it's somebody who walks through the door, you know, always take an interest, always, you know, I think you, you first of all, you started off when I started off, you know, you'd be looking for John Smiths and then you realise there aren't that many John Smiths out there and you open your spectrum up of people and you realise there's amazing cooks from all around the world and, and you know, today we're, today we're blessed to have, you know, something like 18 or 19 different nationalities in our kitchen, you know. So, so you know, you have you just, you know, and, and to give people opportunities, really make sure that someone who's keen, who's not that great, you can build them into something that is fantastic. Um, you know, you just can't operate a revolving door. You have to give people opportunities. And the more you kind of take, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? When you take a little bit of a hit to start with in terms of, you know, a bit of rocky road with people where it's, you know, you, you, you've got to invest that time into someone. Once you get past that, you know, you really, you really get a lot more out of it than, than you think. So, you know, I, you see so many people go, oh, you know, after a few months or two months, you know, they go, oh, you're no good. It's not true. It's about how much you, you're willing to invest into those people and, and how much your team is investing into that as well. So, you know, we hold the, the point, it won't be up to us that someone will fail in our kitchen. You know, we will give them every single opportunity to be a success. This episode is proudly supported by Montague Plums, handpicked for you. So the eating experience of our plums is sweet. That's a primary driver. It's got to be sweet, but it's also got to have enough acid because the mix of acid and sugar is what is what gives fruit its flavour. And in a plum, it tends to be slightly higher acidity. And then um, a really nice, full, not dry, but juicy um, explosion of juice into your mouth as you as you bite into it. That's that's Nirvana for us in terms of plum. For more information, go to montague.com.au. You had a, a dramatic change in your career moving to the nation's capital, executive chef of the National Gallery and the staff catering at Parliament House. How different was that world compared to Otto on the Wharf? Um... <laughs> Well, yes, different in terms of it wasn't quite the most glamorous role, I suppose. But um, you know, there were some other there are there were some other pieces in that um, that I was managing as well. Uh, there was there was uh, the catering or the or the, the sort of cafeteria style stuff at the de, the defence department um, administrative buildings as well, and 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 I think you know it was just another sort of growth path for me you know I'd sort of been in this really high profile role at Otto and I was offered this role that was really managing multiple outlets and all the various things that go in there into each one of them and there was functions there was you know there was one day we'd be you know delivering a function for 300 people at the National Gallery the next day you're you know, helping make muffins and sandwiches and at uh, at one of the administrative buildings, and then you you know you've got a 
an ever evolving menu at our restaurant and and so it was just a really amazing opportunity to you know uh, create a different um, experience for myself and and put a few more feathers in the cap in terms of what I could do within my career and I, I think most people looked at it going what is this guy doing? <laughs> you know, why is he moving to Canberra? This is completely ridiculous. And they, and, and I really got it, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, I'd sort of been at Otto for eight years at the time and, and, and I just needed a really different challenge. And I didn't feel like I needed the intense scrutiny of Sydney in another restaurant. I felt like I, I, felt like I needed something that was just – really different and I, and I got that and and it was amazing I got to work again with some really interesting pe- people who were great at so many different things you know like um, I got to work with your your brother who was a fantastic <laughs> book I mean that was the highlight Anthony you know, uh, <laughs> he'll be pleased to hear that <laughs> but you know um, you know he was awesome and and guys who could deliver functions and you know guys who knew how to deliver uh, or chefs who knew how to deliver you know to upwards of you know, a few thousand meals a day through administrative cafes. You know, like it's it's such a such a different world, and and it was a great opportunity. And I got to live somewhere else, which I really enjoyed. And and I've still got great mates down there. You know, Ben uh, Willis from Aubergine. I went and did a couple of nights with him when he was short staffed. So, and we became mates. And so you end up just having this lovely spectrum of of uh, friends within your industry in all sorts of different parts of the world or, or, or the country. And it's, and that's a really nice thing, I think. So, yeah. You know, rather than just staying in one place for, for eons. So, yeah. What brought you back to Sydney? You, you came back a couple of years before going to cafe Sydney, but what made, what triggered the move? Well, um, the mother of my daughter, uh, Naomi, she um, she really wanted to come back to Sydney, which is fair enough. Um, I think, you know, I had a health issue. I actually had a, a full hip replacement on the right-hand side that needed to be done. Yeah, I was living in a bit of pain, and, and that was just due to lifestyle and probably playing too much football for too long and all sorts of things. I mean, I, you know, everything else is perfectly fine except for this this particular hip for whatever reason. But um, so I needed to take a bit of a break and get that done and get that right. So I did that. Um, we were actually planning to go overseas for probably six months or so, but but that sort of um, uh, put that on the back burner. Um, and I think that was really probably about it. You know, Naomi really wanted to come back and start doing what she wanted to be doing. Um, and I was perfectly fine with that. And uh, we've been down there for, I think, two and a half years. It was a great experience. And, and look, you know, there was probably a few things that were happening sort of internally in the company that made it a bit easier to sort of move. But, you know, it was it was, uh, it was just really coming home and, and probably being around our sort of support network as well, whether that being family and friends. When you've got a young child that's only one, you know what that's like. You've got twins. <laughs> <laughs> help <laughs> help <laughs> um so yeah that was that was really the long and the short of it really you spent a bit of time uh, at Dalton house but the majority of your time back in sydney has been at cafe sydney T- tell us about getting that role and the pressure of such an iconic venue um, when you first came on board do you know, it was strange. I was walking down the street and I got this phone call from the recruiter because he, you know, had been given my name through another industry person and they knew that I was free. I ended up having a 45-minute conversation while I was standing on the corner of George Street and, and King Street in the city and I ended up meeting Jan. We had a, a really great conversation about the role Um You know, she, I've got to say, has given me this opportunity to be an executive chef, to hold an executive role, but also be uh, a single dad, Um, enable me to be, uh, you know, to have that aspect of my life, but still hold on to um, an amazing role. Um, So that was probably the biggest part of moving back into that sort of style of role. Um, and so that was sort of ticked. Um, and then, you know, the conversation that, that she and I had in terms of how the kitchen needed to be operate, 
operated and how it needed to develop and 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 move forward um you know seemed to be incredible synergy they said just you know it was there was incredible synergies there um and we sort of got into it and and i think you know the process lasted about 10 days we signed up and i started you know very quickly and and you know, it's sort of, you know, she has just been an instrumental part of my development over the last sort of seven years of being there. She's um, certainly a, 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 a cracking human being and, and someone whose um, oh, management has helped me develop, you know, to another level, I think. She's, she, she's remarkable. Yeah. Well, tell us a bit about the kitchen and, and what food you're doing there. What, what does it take to deliver food at the level that you're um, – dealing with with like 600 covers a day and and to be such a renowned restaurant as well um keep it simple uh to a great degree use amazing produce um we we're really blessed with what we get access to especially with that volume um you you need to to tell you all the secrets but the what, what you need to do is you you need to um you just you need you, you can walk to a lot of different restaurants and you can have a look at their menus and you can sort of, you know exactly which suppliers they're using. You know, it, it's a real sort of uh, uh, an easy menu to work out. But when you sort of come to Cafe Sydney, what you want is you want to have a whole lot of different backstories to your food like anybody does. But the beauty of running something like that is that, is that you can take up the production of, of one particular item from someone or you can take, be one of a few people who get a particular product because you can, you can constantly support using all of it. And so you can create a very unique menu within the context of a high-volume uh, restaurant and that enables you, the diner to come in and have a very unique experience and one that's amazing because the, the quality of produce is, is second to no other restaurant in, in Sydney, I can tell you. Like people just, whether that be the all of the Australian cheeses that we use, whether that be the meat, the seafood and the fruit and veg, I mean, it's, it's really it's really great. So I think that's the first thing. You need to have great quality product. Um and then all those other things that I was saying about running the staff, um, they're really critical, making sure that you are constantly manoeuvring people. So the first thing that we say to people when they come on board is we say, look, we view your employment here as about a two-year experience. If you don't see it as that, that's perfectly fine with us. Go choose something else. But by doing that, it establishes what you want for that person, You know what you want for the business as well and how you're going to do that and so that when someone's with you they have a clear path of you know how their their development is going to happen and then and so that enables you to keep people i think really for long periods of time and that enables incredible consistency and then during that period of time you can work on people it takes a couple of years until you've got a really good technical level within the in the business that enables you to do you know a few bits and pieces that are a little bit more interesting than what you would expect from a, a place that's high volume. So, you know, it's but it's this it's this constant um, you know amount of energy that you've got to put into uh, put into it. So I suppose that's that's really how it works. To be quite honest, a part of taking the role at Cafe City was to have that life work balance that um, you wanted. What, what sort of impact has that had on you having that balance? Um, yeah, so it's definitely a bigger balance. I mean, it's, you're still at executive level, um, so there still are those hours that you've got to achieve, I think. But when, you know, I have my daughter, you know, uh, when she's with me, you know, I have I have time. You know, I have time to be present. I have time to go to the football games. I have time to, you know, go to the, you know, the, the you know, the, um, the, plays or the musicals uh, I can go pick her up and on certain days or if she's sick you know um, and she's with me then I just have to say to Jan look you know Luna's sick and she goes no problem and and we'll see, we'll see you tomorrow let us know what's going on so look to have that balance is is phenomenal um, it, it just enables you to connect with 
not only family but friends and 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 to have some semblance of of normality um, that other people get as well so it's it's really nice it's it's good uh, but at the same time you still have a very dynamic and interesting role that that you know that you have to be always concentrating on so yeah you mentioned a bit earlier the um, crazy hours you did as a young chef and those times have changed and you found work-life balance for yourself. How, how do you create that for so many in a massive brigade uh, and give them the work-life balance that they need? Well, look, I mean, I think that we're fortunate enough to have the business that enables us to employ the amount of people that we need um, and that... You know, uh, for the most part, I think people are, are really pulling down very, very standard hours. Um, but to do that, you you have to, you know, you look at someone's week as a Monday to Friday or a Tuesday to Saturday or a Wednesday to Sunday and you rotate people to doing a, a you know, a succession of days or a succession of nights. Um, if someone's got something that's important to them, you know, whether it be a mate's 21st or a, a family event that, that you, you know, you really want them to be a part of, they just have to come and tell you, give me, give me a couple of weeks notice so we can factor it into the roster and, and, and we'll make it happen. Uh, I don't think, I think in, in seven years, I'm only denied one or two requests and that was because they were late and we already had people who'd already made requests and, and we just couldn't shift things around in terms of of uh, the experience level in the kitchen for that particular shift on that particular night or something like that. So I think you just got to make that stuff happen for people. And if you do, people really appreciate it. Well, it's uh, winter and a little bit chillier. What, what's a dish that you can tell us about and ingredients you're using sort of right now that you're really excited about? Oh, what am I excited about? Um, you know, chestnuts. Chestnuts have just, you know, they've, they've been around for a bit, but um, probably the dessert that I'm really loving, and I, I posted it recently on Instagram, was this Paris Bress, which is a, essentially is a donut-shaped shoe pastry, which is 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 got this crackling on top, which is like a sugar bake, which makes the outside of the shoe paste become really crunchy and, and sugary. And then in the middle, we're doing a, a, a chestnut cremo um, with, um, you know, grated chestnut and apple and apple puree and, and uh, these cinnamon meringues. And it's a, it's a pretty classic dessert, but it's, I think, you know, and we're also using chestnut with a quail dish at the moment and, and uh, you know, a quail with, with chestnut and potato puree and, and pancetta and, uh, and burnt, burnt sage butter. So those sorts of ingredients. You know, quinces are on on at the moment and, you know, sort of all that kind of thing. And you have to work a little bit harder in autumn and winter, um, you know, to sort of, I think, to, you know, to hold the food where it needs to be because you don't have the luxury of, you know, berries and passion fruits and, you know, green vegetables coming out of, um, coming out of er everywhere, you know, sort of spring you've got zucchini flowers and you've got broad beans and you've got asparagus coming and all those sorts of things winter winter requires a little bit more effort and uh but you know it's still a great season to be cooking you know you've had a an incredible and varied career from added restaurants of influence to uh, the nation's capital with the gallery and uh, parliament house and you know one of australia's most iconic venues cafe sydney what what, what is it that you love about what you do um, entertaining people. Um, I don't think you can ever lose sight of the fact that the customer is always the most important person uh, or people. Um, and I like giving them a good time. I mean, I think that people come in to celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, you know, all sorts of things or, or a business meal or – and people pay a lot of money uh, for that experience. Days, You know, it, it hasn't got cheaper, that's for sure. And, um, and so – I always really enjoy that aspect of it. I think it's the bit that kind of, it sort of translates through everything. So the relationships that you have with producers um, through to the relationship that you um, have with your customers or your guests is, um, you know, they're the most important important things um, to the success of your business. And I, and I find those the most enjoyable, especially the older I get, you know, um, you know, you enjoy that sort of, uh, you know, human interaction um, that you get through, you know, doing business in whichever 
in whichever form you, you you're doing it. So, yeah, I think that's probably uh, the most enjoyable thing that I, I I like these days. I've got to say, yeah. Well, James, uh, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story, and um, hopefully we can catch up with, again with you soon and uh, hear a few more. Look forward to it. Thanks, Anthony. Have a great day. Speak soon. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.